Where are we? Well, we're uh, investigating uh, the question well, how language relates to reality. Uh, and you're going to have a chance uh, to do some of your own investigating uh, because uh, today you get the first handout sheet of sample questions. Now, please don't answer all five questions. The idea is to give you a choice. Pick the one that seems like it's most fun or most interesting and write about that. And the instructions are, so to speak, uh, tediously precise. You're even told how many spaces you have to have and what size of uh, typeface. I'm perfectly happy if you have 1.5 spaces rather than two, but anyway, I, I leave these uh, fine points up to you in the GSI. Uh, okay, but anyway, uh, that's the, uh, the bureaucratic part, and I think we're kind of up with the syllabus, so you should be keeping up with the reading and um, uh, doing all the stuff that's on the syllabus, and I think I'm kind of where I'm supposed to be on the uh, lectures, on the uh, sequence of topics we're covering. All right, now if we're going to talk about how language relates to reality, uh, we have to distinguish the general approach and the specifics. And of course, philosophy depends on getting the specifics exactly right. Uh, the general approach, I'm pretty convinced, is right. The general approach is that language relates to reality in ways that we describe as true or false or uh, relevant or irrelevant, or cases of promises kept or broken, or orders obeyed or disobeyed. Uh, language re relates to reality because speakers relate it intentionally. It is a form of intentional behavior on the part of speakers that enables them to relate to reality. Now this means that in that distinction I made in the very first lecture between the meaning of the words and sentences on the one hand and the meaning of the speakers. On the other hand, speaker's meaning is primary. Now think of the meaning of the sentence as sort of a frozen or fungible uh, speaker meaning, something the speaker can haul out and pass around. But it's the speaker meaning which is essential. Uh, it is the whole point of having sentences is so that speakers can talk and write a sentence is to talk with or to communicate with. So the crucial question then is, well, how do you do it? And this again, again, as I've said, in philosophy you have to allow yourself to be flabbergasted by what any sane person thinks is too obvious even to be worth noting. And the things that's too obvious to be worth noting is that I make these funny noises through my mouth and somehow or other they have these remarkable effects. I, I make an assertion or ask a question or give a command or make an apology. And how, the question then is, how do you get from the noises to the speech act? And it might seem that that question is different from the question how language relates to reality, uh, but I don't think it is. I think the question of how you get from sound to meaning and the question of how language relates to reality, at bottom are the same question because the whole point of meaning is to enable us to relate words to something other than just words, to the world outside of language. Okay, so now then, well, what's the, that's the general approach. What are the details? What's the detailed account? And here I'm going to uh, explain the ideas of Paul Grice. I think they were very important ideas. I was at the original uh, uh, seminars, and it was a long time ago, over 50 years ago, in Oxford, where Grice and Strawson developed all this stuff. And part of what Grice did was uh, answer uh, various uh, counterexamples, including one by me. But I want, first of all, to give you the bare bones, the guts of his analysis because I think there's something right about it. I think he captures an essential part of human linguistic communication, but I think the details need improvement. I think in the details aren't quite right, and if we can say exactly how, we might make some progress. Okay, here's the idea, and I think there's something right about this. If you think, what is it like to communicate meaningfully with other people, it's different from other kinds of intentional action 
because if you can get the other people to recognize that you're trying to tell them something and what it is exactly you're trying to tell them, then in some sense you've succeeded. You've told them. And that's not true of human behavior generally. Uh, if you want to uh, become uh, uh, president of the United States or you want to be rich or marry a Republican, you don't succeed just by getting other people to recognize your intention. But where language and speech and, and uh, uh, meaningful communication is concerned, it looks like you can succeed just by getting people to recognize your intention. Let me give you a real life example. I was once driving a truck through Yugoslavia. Don't ask me how, but anyway, there I was. And uh, we had a problem in Skopje. Now, I don't recommend ever getting a breakdown in Skopje. Let's see if I can still remember how to spell the damn name. If anybody here is from Skopje, I apologize for the rude remarks that I'm about to make. Anyway, here I was in Skopje, uh, and this was still, when it was still Yugoslavia, and it was a hell of a town. And the only thing I remember was any good about it was the beer. You could get drinkable pivo. But we had a breakdown in our Bedford truck and I was trying to explain uh, to the uh, mechanic what I thought was wrong, uh, that I thought we had a broken crankshaft. And so he didn't speak any uh, English or, or German or any other language I could speak. And in a sense, I got in a lot of trouble in Yugoslavia by speaking German. I don't recommend that either. Uh, but I, 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 so what I had to do was do a kind of an imitation of a broken crankshaft. I won't. Uh, do that now, but you can imagine it. Now, what was I trying to do? Here I am making these, pointing at the engine and making these movements. What do I want the guy to think? I don't want him to think this guy is spastic or he's obviously got a mental problem. I don't want him to think that. What do I want him to think? I want him to think, one, he's trying to tell me something. And two, what exactly is it he's trying to tell me? Oh, he's trying to tell me there's something specifically wrong with his engine. Okay, but now here is the remarkable thing. If he figures out that I'm trying to tell him something and figures out what exactly it is that I'm trying to tell him, then I've succeeded. I don't have to do any more. Succeeding consists in getting him to recognize his, uh, getting him to recognize my intention because my intention, and this is, was Grice's uh, uh, main insight, my, his intention is uh, my intention is to produce an effect on him by getting him to recognize my intention to produce that effect. And that seems to me a remarkable fact about human communication. And in the original article, uh, Grice put this uh, by the formula that I give at the top here. And a speaker S meant something by an utterance U if and only if S intended to produce an effect, that's E, in H, that's dear old E and H uh, and S, those are, our, uh, uh, those are the stars of the speech act situation, the speaker and the hearer and the effect. S intended to produce an effect in the hearer by getting the hearer to recognize S's intention to produce the effect. Has everybody got that? That's the basic idea, and that's the idea. I, I think I, I didn't look at Grice's original, I'm doing this from memory, but I think that was the original formulation that he used in his article called Meaning in 1957. Uh, okay, now I want to make sure everybody got the basic idea because now I'm going to tell you some things that I think are wrong with it and how we might improve on it. Now, let me tell you uh, the wonderful thing about contemporary philosophy is its incredible scholasticism. And what happened in this particular case was everybody came up with a counterexample. Even I came up with a counterexample. Peter Strawson came up. Jim Urmson came up. Uh, Steve Schiffer came up with a bunch of counterexamples. So Grice had this whole army of counterexamples, and then he fussed around with the original formulation to try to meet all the counterexamples. And I'll tell you some of his maneuvers. And if you're interested, you could Google this stuff, and you will find a whole, there's, there's a whole literature, there's a raft of uh, articles and books about this subject, but this is the basic target. This is the basic idea under analysis. And now I'm going to tell you the objections to it. But first, let's take questions. Everybody get the fundamental idea. And the fundamental idea is 
Human meaningful communication is different from other kinds of intentional behavior because you can succeed just by getting your hearer to recognize what you're trying to achieve, what the success is you're trying to achieve. Once the hearer recognizes it, <coughs> he, you've succeeded, and there's a name for the hearer's side. It's called understanding. So on the speaker's side, you have meaning. That's the production, the production of the noise or the gestures uh, with the intention to produce a certain effect. And on the hearer's side, you have understanding, and understanding just consists in the recognition of the meaning intention. So you get this twin relation between meaning and understanding. Meaning is the intention to produce understanding. Understanding is the recognition of meaning. Okay, now I wanted that, sound, that to sound simple, but in fact the whole thing becomes incredibly complicated in a couple of minutes. But let me make sure everybody's, before we get off in the deep water, we're just standing, putting our toe in the water here, now we're gonna jump in the swamp. I don't know if I like that metaphor, but anyway, uh, it's what we're gonna do. So let's take questions about that. Everybody's got the basic idea. I think the basic idea is pretty good. Yeah, at the very back. Yeah, the speaker, all the speaker has to do, all the hearer has to do is recognize the speaker's intentions. Uh, if, the, um, if the hearer succeeds in recognizing the intentions, then that's it. Then, the, then the, the speaker will have achieved his intention to produce the effect because the effect is produced by getting the hearer to recognize the intention. Now immediately though, there's a qualification. I have been ambiguous in talking about producing effects, and Grice always talked about those as things like producing beliefs or producing further actions. Whereas the effect I was talking about was just understanding. What's the difference between understanding the utterance and coming to believe it, for example? Well, you all know that difference. It's the difference between the illocutionary act and the perlocutionary act. And here's one immediate objection to Grice's account. All of the examples were intentions to produce perlocutionary effects, such as the, the hearer coming to believe. So you say it's raining, or uh, Obama's gonna have trouble uh, in the November, uh, in the congressional elections. And there, the, the effect that Grice wanted was the effect of me believing what you say. But that doesn't seem quite right because that's a perlocutionary effect and I, I, it looks like meaning can't include the perlocutionary effect because you can say something and mean it and succeed in uh, communicating the meaning without intending to produce a perlocutionary effect. I'll give you some examples of that. Incidentally, there's a problem here and that is, of course, Grice was acutely aware of all of Austin's apparatus and of his terminology, but he was damned if he was gonna use any of Austin's uh, uh, vocabulary or any of Austin's categories. So when I, I pointed out to him, look, all of these cases are cases of perlocutionary acts. Well, he fiddled around with it and tried to get out of that by saying, well, the intended effect of an assertion is not that the, the hearer should believe the assertion, but that the hearer should believe that the speaker believes it. But that won't work either, I, I, for reasons that I'll tell you in a moment. But anyway, that's the idea. The idea is you just get, I mean, I think the correct idea in Grice is that in communication, you succeed in producing understanding when uh, the hearer recognizes your intentions. And that, I think, is, is uh, right. And you, if you, you'll see this in a dramatic way. I mean, in, if you live in a, in a country where I, you're fluent in the language and you have no problem, uh, then you take all this for granted. But if you're in a, a, in a, a really foreign uh, a, a country or in a foreign culture where you have real problems with a language, then you become acutely aware of the difficulties of getting people to recognize what it is you're trying to communicate. Uh, okay, and by the way, there are all kinds of problems I have discovered in traveling uh, uh, abroad and asking questions. One is, no Italian male 
can admit that he doesn't know where something is located. If you say, where is the Via Dante? I, I, Italian females can say, I don't know. And no Italian guy can ever say, I don't know. He has to say, he has to invent some answer. So you listen patiently for his answer, and then you go ask somebody else. You can tell by the form of the answer whether or not they actually know the answer to the question or whether they're trying to think of something to say. Uh, anyhow, that's a, a, a footnote here about uh, communicating while traveling abroad. Okay, now with, with this basic, uh, basic picture here, let me tell you some objections to it. Well, first of all, there were a whole bunch of counter examples, and I won't go through all of them. For one thing, I don't even remember all of them, but I can tell you the ones uh, that I remember best. Now, maybe one of the most effective uh, was by Peter Strawson, and he said, look, uh, there's something left out of the analysis because there has to be a kind of shared understanding, and you can see that if you imagine that what the, the speaker does, what S does, is arrange evidence where uh, the hearer will know that the speaker is arranging the evidence, but the hearer won't know that the speaker knows uh, that the, now I don't want to say this right, that uh, the hearer won't know that the speaker knows that the hearer knows that the speaker knows. Uh, why? Because this is a case where the speaker is concealing part of his intention. Now, in lectures, Strawson always gave a nice example. Uh, when it came to writing, there was a kind of fastidiousness in Oxford where you'd never give a vulgar example like this in writing. But anyway, here's the example. It's a good example. I uh, suppose there are two cavemen. I uh, call them Sam and Bill. And Sam is trying to communicate to Bill uh, that there have been lions messing around his cave. Now, he knows that Bill is up in a tree watching him, and he's got an old lion's foot that he keeps in his pocket uh, for good luck. And so while Bill is watching him, he hauls out the lion's foot and makes a bunch of lion tracks around his cave. Okay. Now, it looks like in that case, he intends to produce an effect. He intends Bill to think that he's supposed to believe that there have been lions messing around his cave. He intends Bill uh, to recognize that intention, and he intends the recognition of the intention to function as a reason for the effect, as a reason for the belief. But all the same, that's not a case of real communication because the hearer doesn't fully understand what's going on. The hearer just thinks that this is a case of leaving evidence. And leaving evidence by itself is not enough for meaning in the relevant sense of communication. Okay, so that's one counter example. I'll give you a bunch and then we'll stop and discuss them. Now there's a counter example that I thought of, um, and that's this. It's a funny thing about Grice's account that you ought to be able to say anything and mean anything. All you've got to do is, is intend to produce a certain effect. But there are restrictions on what you can mean if you know what, if the words have a conventional meaning and you know that meaning. So I imagine the following counterexample. I am an American soldier captured by the Italians in the Second World War. Uh, this was a long time ago I thought of this example. Um, I'm an American soldier captured by the Italians in the Second World War. I want to get them to believe that I'm really a German officer uh, disguised, that I'm dressed up as an American uh, private, but I'm really a German officer. I don't, I'd like to tell them in Italian or German that I'm a German officer, but I don't know any Italian and I don't know any German, but I remember a line of poetry. German poetry that I had to memorize in a high school German course. It's a poem about Italy, uh, in fact. And the line of German poetry goes, Kennst du das Land, wo die Zitronen blühen? It's from Goethe, and it means, Knowest thou the land where the lemon trees bloom? Okay, and I know that it means that because I had to memorize a whole damn thing. Okay, so it's a poem about Italy. Now, I want these guys to think that I'm telling them I'm a German officer. So I do my best German officer imitation. I click my heels and throw my shoulders back and shout in, in heavy duty uh, a German accent. Kennst du das Land, wo die Zitronen blühen? Okay, now, 
according to Grice, I intended to produce an effect. I intended to produce the effect of them believing that I a German officer. And I intended, them, I intended to produce that effect by getting them to recognize my intention to produce it. I want them to think, what the hell is this guy spouting German for? He must be trying to tell us something. What the hell is he trying to tell us? Oh, I see, with all those other ridiculous gestures he's made, yeah, he's some kind of a crowd officer. Uh, I, that's what I want him to reason. I want him to think along those lines. Now, all the same, it seems funny to me to say in that case that I really meant Ich bin ein deutscher Offizier, or even I am a German officer, because that's not what the words mean. You can't just say anything and mean anything, or so I argued in this, in this far-off day. And Grice had uh, interesting answers that he gave uh, uh, to that as well. So here are two uh, counterexamples. Uh, there is the counterexample of the caveman who satisfies all the conditions, but it looks something like something's left out, and uh, Strawson says, well, maybe what's left out is you've got to have an I-4, and that is H recognizes I-2. But then if you're going to do that, then any philosopher will tell you, watch out, because it looks like you're going to have an infinite regress. You're going to need an I-5 that he recognizes I-4, and so on. Uh, and in my case, it looks like you're going to have to put some kind of constraints on what you can say and what you can mean. One way to put the force of my uh, acclaimed counterexample is this. On Grice's account, it doesn't look like you could get them to think that you meant something that you didn't really mean. But I think you can do that. That is, I think you can uh, pretend to mean something, even though you know the words that you're using don't mean that or anything like it. All right, however, I, I need to stop for a discussion of these counterexamples because then I want to make what I think are much more radical objections to the approach and try to show what's going on, what, what is the right way uh, out of this. So questions about the counterexamples. There are two counterexamples I've given you so far. Uh, there is uh, um, Strawson's example of the cavemen who leave evidence with the intention that that should produce an effect on the hearer. But it's not a case of communication because there's no shared understanding. They're not understanding the situation in the same way. And then there's my claim that you need to distinguish between what I, I, the speaker means and what the sentence means but he can't, you can't just say anything and mean anything. I can't now say 2 plus 2 equals 4 and mean that uh, Barack Obama is having a lot of trouble with Congress. Now, if I rig up the context, if I say, look, whenever I say 2 plus 2 equals 4, what I mean is, okay, that's a code. If I set up a code, then I can do that. But just out of the blue, you can't say anything and mean anything, or at least so uh, that was the form of my argument. Okay, questions about all that, because now I want to go deeper into what I think are some of the strengths and weaknesses of this account. Everybody's up with us on that. Okay, well, let me now make uh, some more serious objections. If you go through Grice's article, all of the cases that he gives are cases of producing perlocutionary effects. And there's a serious objection to that. Namely, you can perform a speech act, mean exactly what you say. The speech act can be perfectly in order, and yet you do not intend to produce a perlocutionary effect. Uh, uh, during uh, the dreadful days of the revolting students, I often had to give lectures where I knew uh, that people would think uh, they wouldn't believe a word I said uh, because I was... Uh, well, I, I was suspect because I was al already over 30 years old, and that was a terrible thing. Um, and uh, I knew in advance that they weren't going to believe what I said, but, also, but all the same, I meant everything I said. I meant all the words uh, that I said, I, and I, I said those and meant those without any intention to produce the perlocutionary effect of them believing me or agreeing with me because I knew in advance that they wouldn't. It's an interesting thing about intention 
that in order to intend to do something, you have to believe that it's possible. So I can't intend to jump over this building. Uh, I can wish I could jump over the building and I can intend to raise my arm, but I cannot intend to jump over the building because I know it's impossible. So there were cases where I said something and mean it and meant it and did not intend to produce a perlocutionary effect. Does everybody see that a point? That it's possible to say something and mean something and not intend to produce the, per the perlocutionary effect because for one reason or another, uh, the hearer uh, is impervious. Uh, the hearer may not be uh, listening. Uh, the hearer um, <clears throat> uh, may uh, uh, be uh, suspicious of you and assume that anything you say is a lie. So you cannot define meaning in terms of intending to produce the correlated perlocutionary effect because you can say something and mean something and not intend to produce that effect. Okay, now when I wrote the book, Speech Acts, I thought, well, there's a neat way out of this. The intention of the Speech Act is not to produce a perlocutionary effect, but it's to produce an illocutionary effect. It is to produce understanding. And indeed, it must be to produce understanding because the Speech Act won't succeed if you don't produce understanding. And in consequence, it must be part of intending to perform the Speech Act that you intend to produce understanding. So though I didn't intend to convince those guys, all the same, I did intend to produce an understanding of my utterance. I wanted them to understand what I was saying, and I intended that they should understand what I said. And I couldn't have intended to perform the speech act without that because the intention to, the, the un, production of understanding is essential to the successful performance of the speech act. Okay, has everybody got that? Does everybody see that point? So it looks like there's a neat way out of the objection uh, that uh, Grice mistakes the perlocutionary effect for the illocutionary effect, and that is just redefine the effects there as an illocutionary effect, and then it looks like you have evaded this objection. Now, you can't just say, well, it's an intention to produce understanding, because then the account is too circular. You don't want to define meaning in terms of understanding, but you can specify what is, constitutes the illocutionary effect by specifying the conditions on the speech act. And that's what I do in the book that you're reading, in, in the book Speech Acts. I give the conditions on the successful performance of the speech act, and then I say that the speaker intends uh, to produce that effect, namely the illocutionary effect of understanding, by getting uh, the uh, hearer to recognize his intention to produce that effect. And now here comes language. If he's speaking literally, then he does that because he relies on the hearer's knowledge of what the sentence means. It sounds complicated, but in real life it's very simple. I intend to produce in this guy the knowledge that I'm telling him that it's raining, and I say it's raining, and then he knows that he's been told that it's raining. Whether or not he believes me, I don't give a damn here. I'm just, my job is to speak the truth, and I tell him that it's raining, and I produce that effect on him by getting him to recognize my, my intention to produce that effect. And I have a wonderful device by which I can produce that effect. Namely, I know that he speaks English, and so I utter a sentence of English. So everybody's got that. Now, what Grice was, did was very interesting. In his rewrite of this, and we had a lot of discussions about this, and, and in his uh, reworking of this, in his attempt to meet these objections, he said the intention that goes with meaning is not the intention to produce the perlocutionary effect of believing, but it's just to produce the effect of believing that the speaker believes it. Will that avoid the problem? I don't think so, because the same people who, whom I knew wouldn't believe me were convinced that I was lying and consequently wouldn't believe that I, would, that I believed it. So the difficulty that I can say something and mean it without intending to produce belief 
is not resolved by saying I can say something and mean it and only intend to produce the belief that I believe because I can also speak meaningfully without intending to produce the belief that I believe. I'm sorry that was such a goddamn long sentence. Did everybody get it? I'll say it. I'm not sure I can say it again this early in the morning. But anyway, let me try it. The idea is this. Grice was aware of the objection that these are all perlocutionary effects. He thought he could get out of that objection by just saying, well, the intention is not to produce the belief about the state of affairs in the world that it's raining, but just to produce the belief that the speaker believes it, because that's what it really what I'm trying to convey to the guy, not that such and such is the case in the world, but I believe that such and such is, is the case. So that was the first move to evade, evade this objection, but it doesn't work because the same objection now still holds. I, just as I can make a statement without intending to produce belief, so I can make a statement without even intending to produce the belief that I believe. The same people that I think I can't convince, I might also know I can't convince them that I believe what I'm saying. They will think I'm lying, I, even though I am speaking meaningfully, that is, I mean everything I say, but all the same, I am not attempting to produce either the belief that what I say is true or even the belief that I'm sincere, the belief that I believe what I'm saying. Okay, so now what's the way out of this? Well, I guess situation gets worse, uh, but let me stop for questions. Uh, this is uh, 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 tricky material, but it's important for what follows, so let's see if we can get it right. Question at the back, yeah. Can you speak louder, please? I'm getting hard of hearing at this great distance. Yeah. So you are trying to get an audience to tell them what you mean by it, but you don't intend them to believe it. I do not intend to produce belief in them because I know it's impossible. They're not going to believe me. But knowing that it's impossible to me sounds like you would feel sincerity for what it has that they believe you. Oh, yeah, sure. I hope that they will believe me, but hoping. Uh, that they uh, will believe me is not the same as actually uh, believing that it's possible that they will believe me and thus intending to produce uh, the belief. See, intention implies belief that it's possible. I can't intend to do something if I believe that it is impossible. And that, by the way, is one mark of crazy people, uh, insane people, is that they have uh, intentions for things that we know to be impossible, but they believe that they are possible. Yeah, I mean, they, they really believe uh, that uh, they're going to become president of the United States or, uh, or marry a movie star or whatever it is. Yes? So, you don't have intentions to teach us the philosophy of language? Can you speak louder, please? You don't have the intention to teach us the philosophy of language? I would think you believe that. Yes, oh no, I do have the intention to teach the philosophy of language because I think it can be done. Uh, I've been doing it for 50 years. Uh, and so I'm reasonably confident uh, that it's possible to do it. Now, a lot of people think, well, it's not possible to do it, but they have not convinced me that it's not possible to do it. So I intend to teach the philosophy of language, and I'm firmly convinced that it is possible to do it. However, we'll see. You know, who knows? I might be refuted. Um, all right, so here's where we are then. We've got to the point where Grice's attempt to analyze meanings in terms of perlocutionary effects won't work. But it looks like then the way out of that is to see that he can analyze saying something and meaning it in terms of the intention to produce the illocutionary effect, where the illocutionary effect is not believing the utterance, but just understanding the utterance. Everybody's up with this. All right, but now that won't work either, uh, and here's why. It's perfectly possible for me to say something mean what I say, and not even intend to produce understanding. It's true that the speech act is defective, and this is why we all made the same mistake. Me and Strawson and Grice and everybody who wrote about this, we all made the mistake of thinking, well, you must intend to produce some effect, otherwise you wouldn't succeed in performing the speech act. Yes, but there are two parts to the speech act. There's the meaning part and the communication part, and it is possible 
that you might say something, mean what you say, and not even intend to produce an illocutionary effect. Now, you might say, yeah, but any examples you give of that are going to be crazy. I mean, they're going to be uh, uh, intentionally defective. They're going to be cases where you know that the Speech Act won't succeed. That's right. But all the same, even in those cases, you have to distinguish between saying something and meaning it and saying something with the intention to communicate that meaning. And the general difficulty with Grice, now this is a serious objection, is it seems to me there is a confusion between meaning and communication. Grice assumes that the intention that constitutes meaning is the intention to communicate that meaning, but I want to say you need to distinguish between meaning and the intention that is constitutive of meaning and communicating and the intention which and that the intention to communicate is the intention to communicate the meaning. Let me give you some examples of that, and you will see that there are cases of defective speech acts. Back to Yugoslavia. I, I was at the border once, and some obstre extremely obstreperous officials uh, were giving me, as they say, a hard time. Uh, and so I told these guys in ordinary colloquial American English, what I thought of them, their country, uh, their regime, uh, the head of their uh, country, and all the rest of it. I told them that in rather rude terms of colloquial American English, but it was not part of my intention that they should understand what I was telling them. I might still be at the Yugoslav border if uh, they had understood what I told them. I won't repeat all the obscenities, but it turns out I had rather well, uh, well stocked with the obscenities that, uh, that all American males learn in high school or whenever they learn it. Um, and so I let them have it. But I, I, I did it in the full knowledge that they didn't understand a word of what I said, and it was not my intention that they should understand. Now, you can say correctly, yes, but then the Speech Act was defective. And that's right, it was defective, and it was intended to be defective. But within the Speech Act, you have to determine the meaning intention and the communicating intention. And now I can make what I think is the, uh, the most fundamental objection to Grice, and that is we need to distinguish the meaning intention from the communication intention, and Grice tries to analyze meaning in terms of the intention to communicate, and that's wrong. So the picture we have is you've got the speaker, and here's the hearer, and you create this meaningful package, FP, and then the intention to communicate that package is different from the intention to create the package, and the, and the you have to create the package before you can communicate it. Meaning is prior to communication because what gets communicated is the meaning. You create the illocutionary package. You create the meaningful entity, the meaningful speech act, and then you communicate that to the hearer. And you communicate that to the hearer by getting the hearer to recognize your intention to communicate that package. So that part of Grice is right. We could summarize what I'm saying by saying the difficulties we've been encountering with Grice, almost all, not all of them, but almost all of them, have to do with the fact that Grice is not distinguishing meaning from communicating, and we need to distinguish within the Speech Act the creation of the meaningful entity, the presentation of a propositional content with a certain illocutionary point or a certain illocutionary force, you need to distinguish the creation of that from its communication from the speaker to the hearer. Now, how does it work, the communication? The communication works by getting the hearer to recognize the package, to recognize that you have created this intentionally. But that creation is the meaning intention. Well, what exactly is the meaning intention? If Grice analyzes communication and not meaning, what exactly is meaning? Well, that's the next question I'm going to answer. But now, we've been through, in, in the past few minutes, an enormously complex set of arguments. I don't want to make sure everybody's up with us. See, what I'm saying is, part of what I'm saying is, 
When I wrote Speech Acts, I thought the way out of Grice's problem is just to see that the intention that constitutes meaning is not the intention to produce a perlocutionary effect, but rather the intention to produce understanding, what I call the illocutionary effect. Now I'm saying even that concedes too much to Grice because it's perfectly possible to perform a speech act that you know is defective. It's defective in the sense that you didn't succeed in communicating it. But all the same, you did say something meaningful and you didn't mean what you said. So now I now owe you an answer to Grice's question. And we have now followed out the thread of the argument. So we've got, I'm saying, there's a distinction between meaning and communicating. Grice gives us a, a correct analysis of communication, not of meaning. So what is meaning? That's my next question. Yes, let's take questions. Yeah. Well, does there have to be a hearer? That's a very good question because, of course, sometimes the speaker and the hearer are identical. Uh, and uh, it, it often happens, uh, I am one such a person, that people talk to themselves. Uh, when I was a ski racer, I was the world's most nervous ski racer, so I went down the mountain shouting obscenities at myself just to try to relax my serve, uh, uh, nerves. Uh, and often, what were the illocutionary force of these? Typically, they were orders, get your goddamn weight on the downhill ski, you know, or foot to foot, or the kind of things that the coaches would tell you. I mean, I, and I'm busy shouting these things to myself. Now, the question is, how many speech acts can you perform to yourself? And I think there are an awful lot that you can perform. Uh, you can certainly make promises to yourself. I promise myself a big glass of beer. Uh, if I finish reading this boring article by tonight. Okay, that's a case of a, of a promise. I give orders to myself all the time. For God's sake, drink less Cabernet Sauvignon tonight. I mean, that's the kind of order that people give to themselves. Now, I, can I thank myself? Well, maybe if I did more things that I was thankful for, but I, I don't remember thanking myself for anything recently. I, I, can I apologize, thank, congratulate myself? Yeah, I, I enjoy congratulating myself. So <laughs> uh, uh, you can do all those now, but I think there's some you can't. You can hint or insinuate to yourself. Um, you know, I'm hinting, and then think of something you would hint to yourself. No, that I think really re require more of a split personality than most of us have. <laughs> Um, so, but it's interesting what speech acts you can perform. Now, actually, there's a deep philosophical point here. Uh, I used to argue that really the fundamental purpose of language is communication. And the answer, objection that was always made to me by people like Chomsky, for example, was, well, what about when you're just thinking? And there I said, that's a limiting case. In the limiting case, S equals H. Uh, and there are awful lots of cases like that. So typically when I'm trying to get something done, I make a list of the things uh, that I got to do. It's called a got a list. I, and I, that's a case where I communicate to my future self. I mean, where you write uh, notes uh, that, that you may be in, intended as the only reader, uh, but that's a case where, you are, where the speaker and the hearer are identical. So I think it's a non-issue, really, and that is, is, does all language require communication? Because sometimes, of course, you're communicating with yourself. You may just be uh, soliloquizing or reflecting where uh, the intended recipient and the speaker are identical. I don't know if that's right, but let's think about it. Yeah. You know, they don't maybe intend, but in hoping isn't their intent? Like, don't they walk yeah. away thinking, I mean, it seems like there's got to be a little bit, otherwise yeah. kind of Why would they do it? It would seem crazy for them to do it if they didn't have any intention uh, to convince you at all. Well, uh, but I think in, the, in that particular case, I mean, uh, um, uh, people are empowered by their faith. I, and they think God is on my side, and I'm conveying God's message. Uh, and consequently, uh, they, uh, they then believe that it's possible to convey God's message because they're not alone. God's helping. I mean, even in the case of teaching a course, though, would you, or telling students something, wouldn't, don't you have some intent in, in the hope that they believe? Otherwise, wouldn't you just say class is out today? Like, 
Well, there are cases where you say something because you feel it's your duty to say it. Now, during uh, various political crises, during the Vietnam War, I would sometimes address audiences who were hostile. I, and I would know in advance uh, that they weren't going to believe what I said. But all the same, I felt somebody ought to say this. I had the duty uh, to say this. Uh, so it was, I, I said what I had to say. Uh, even though I did not uh, expect that they would believe me or accept what I said. And that seems to me perfectly possible. That happens all the time. That's where you address an audience that you know is unsympathetic or hostile. All the same, you have a duty to speak the truth, and so you do it even without any intention to persuade them. Now, in those cases, though, I did intend that they should understand. I would not have given a lecture in French. Uh, to an audience that was entirely English speaking. Uh, that would be a case where you don't intend, I, even that they understand. But these were cases where I intended to produce understanding even though I did not have any hope of convincing them. Say some more. So, yeah. So then is, so communication is just their understanding? Can we say that? Yes. Okay. Communi Here is the picture that I'm substituting in place of grace. The essence of meaning is the creation of the speech act entity, the FP package. Now, I haven't told you how that's done. I'm going to tell you in about a minute how it's done. But the essence of communication is getting the hearer to recognize the package. And you get, and Grice is right about this. You get the hearer to recognize the package by getting the hearer to recognize what it is that you've created, the, the speech act, and that you intend him uh, to recognize it. So you produce understanding by getting the hearer to recognize your intention to produce that understanding. The question is, what is it that the hearer understands? That's what we now have to explain, and that's meaning. Yes, so the, the big question, what is meaning, is still left unanswered. Yes? Yeah. Well, this happens all the time. I mean, uh, religious uh, 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 proselytizers uh, uh, are constantly aware that it's very unlikely uh, that you're going to become uh, converted uh, to whatever it is that they say. But the Jehovah, Jehovah's Witness who come to the door and bore you, or at least they bore me, uh, are precisely that kind of case. I think they have very little hope of convincing me or persuading me, but they are God's messenger. They think that they have a, a, a mission. Yes? That you're not listening. Yeah. Well, okay. There are, that's the case where you don't even tend to produce understanding, and those are the cases where uh, you know See, I, 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 you know that the, the speaker won't pay any attention, the hearer won't pay any attention to you, but all the same you might feel, I have a duty. I'm going to speak the truth even if nobody's listening. And in the case of the Yugoslav border, I'm going to tell these guys what I think, even if it's only just a way of letting off steam, even if, it's just a, 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 even if I know it's a defective speech act. See, they, I, the, a, a, a situations of political and moral crisis are revealing here because people become very stubborn and obdurate. Uh, and, and during the Vietnam War, uh, there were precisely levels of passion in this country that we haven't seen. Uh, we haven't seen anything quite like that since. And in the summer of 1971, uh, I actually had to go and work in the Nixon White House uh, to tell them what they were doing wrong. I was part of something called the Herd Commission. There were four of us. And we went in the Nixon White House and tried to tell these guys that they were screwing up uh, the whole country with their stupid war. And they were not sympathetic uh, uh, to my uh, uh, presentations. Uh, in the end, they did listen to me. They did pay attention. But I had no real hope of convincing them. And indeed, they didn't really want to talk about the war. Don't tell us about the war. Tell us about your students, they would say. And I would say, yeah, well, my students are worried about the war. It's very hard for them to become uh, to be regular university students uh, at the time this war is going on. So we had this failure of communication. And sometimes it got to be absolutely hilarious. Um, uh, uh, one of the reasons I found Ronald Reagan very enduring <laughs> 
endearing is that his people were deeply convinced that I was a communist. <laughs> um, and I used to go, I have to go to regents meeting uh, to, uh, to speak for the faculty. Uh, I, I, it was a waste of time and I should have stuck to philosophy, but I did this kind of nonsense. I, and at regents meeting, one regents meeting, I remember uh, his uh, a lawyer, uh, William French Smith, Bill Smith, was in the chair, and uh, uh, Smith later became Attorney General of the United States. And I said, well, what I think is, and he interrupted me, he said, we all know what you think. Uh, and what he meant by that was, we know a communist when we see one. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, I, it's, you may not find it easy uh, to vote for uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, but still, it's very endearing that he thought I was a communist. Or they, he didn't have, have, waste time thinking about me, but his people did. His people, uh, his attorney general uh, thought I was a communist. Uh, so it's very hard to convince people when you have these absurd gulfs, when you have these absurd gaps. I, and the advantage uh, to the uh, British class system is that the upper classes find it very easy to communicate with each other, even though uh, they have total disagreements. So I had lots of friends in Oxford who were communists or fascists or held various other views. Anything was permissible. And when I say they were fascists, I don't mean they were people you call fascists. You, everybody gets called a fascist. I mean they were actually members of the British fascist party. Uh, so a kid in my college was uh, uh, the son, Michael Mosley was the son of Oswald Mosley, was head of the British fascists. And no one would have thought it was odd or unusual that you should uh, be friends with a fascist, or for that matter, a communist. If I had told my friends uh, in Oxford, I'm going to become a communist, they would have said, how frightfully interesting, John's going to become a communist. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, whereas uh, Americans take all this stuff very seriously and it finds a gulf to communication. I told a, a faculty member here that I had voted for Ronald Reagan for somewhat, uh, I admit, somewhat eccentric reasons and he was appalled. He just, he couldn't bear the thought and in his oral history for the university, you can go look it up, he said there was a terrible change that Searle had become a, a Reaganite Republican. Now, it's a total absurdity, but Americans, I have no sense of humor about these matters. And, and for reasons that Tocqueville pointed out, um, it, it, they lack the security uh, that comes uh, from uh, being, having a secure uh, situation in society, so they're threatened. If you hold views that um, are radically different from theirs, they feel threatened by that in a way that in a, in a class-ridden society, they don't feel threatened. If, you think, if they think they're members of the upper class, they don't give a damn that you're a fascist or a communist. Or, well, maybe if you're a Jacobite. Now, that's a, a special problem in England, but no, I don't know many Jacobites. It's not a real problem. Anyway, you can look it up, uh, what, what a Jacobite is. Uh, but other than that, everybody seemed to get on with everybody else, uh, though we were all cheerful communists, fascists, anarchists, and other such stuff together. Okay, we're, I'm slightly getting off of the uh, track because the message I want to get across is that when you get really diverse opinions, uh, you can uh, say things to people fully in the knowledge that you won't succeed in convincing them, uh, but also in the uh, knowledge in some cases you can perform a defective speech act, you know they won't, not, they're not even listening, they won't pay any attention, they won't understand what you have to say. Okay, we're still left with the question, what exactly is meaning? Now, to answer that question, I have to tell you a little bit about the nature of the mind, and we're going to hear, hear about this in more detail, but I have to tell you a little bit more about intentionality. You remember that intentionality consists in the capacity of the mind to represent objects and states of affairs in the world. So when you have a belief or a desire or a hope or a fear or uh, any of these mental states that are about something, you are representing how things are in the case of belief, how you want them to be in the case of a desire, how you intend to make them be in the case of an intention, and so on through the other cases. Now the key to understanding intentionality is to see each of these mental states as representing with one or the other or one of the various directions of fit, 
representing how things are, how you'd like them to be, how you intend to make them be. And you remember the structure of the intentional state is like that. You have a propositional content in a psychological mode, and whenever you perform one of these, you express one of those. You can't make a speech act with this propositional content and this illocutionary force without expressing this state. Remember this important difference, though. This is an act. This is a speech act. This is not an act. This is a state. Okay, now I want to introduce a crucial notion, and that is every intentional state that has a direction of fit has conditions under which that fit will come about or fail to come about. It has truth conditions in the case of a belief uh, satisfaction conditions in the case of a desire, fulfillment conditions in the case of an intention, and so on through the other cases. And I want to say, let's introduce a technical notion. Every intentional state with a direction of fit is a representation of its conditions of satisfaction. And I'll repeat that. Every intentional state that has a direction of fit, one of these, either this one or this one, uh, is a representation of its conditions of satisfaction. Okay, now if we accept that notion, then we can think of the conditions of satisfaction of an intention as including typically the performance of an action. So if I intend to raise my arm, then my arm goes up, and that's the condition of satisfaction of my intention to raise it. Now then, we're getting close to being able to answer the crucial question. What is the difference between saying something and meaning it and saying it without meaning it? And the, the answer now is simple and rather obvious. The key to understanding meaning, it is the intentional imposition of conditions of satisfaction on sounds or marks or utterances and since the production of the sound or the mark or the utterance is the condition of satisfaction of the intention to produce it, we can say, uh, uh, don't worry if you don't understand this, I'm going to go over it slowly, the essence of meaning is the intentional imposition of conditions of satisfaction on conditions of satisfaction. Yeah, I'm going to say it several times, so you're going to be bored to death with it. We only, but I, I, you're in luck, though. I've only got 20 minutes, uh, so I can only say it so many times in those 20 minutes. The essence of meaning is the intentional imposition of conditions of satisfaction on conditions of satisfaction. So I gave the example of raising my arm. Now, uh, the uh, condition of satisfaction of my raising my intention is just that my arm should go up. But if this is a meaningful gesture, I'm trying to signal somebody to come, I make this type of gesture, then the condition of satisfaction that my arm should move in this way, that movement now has further conditions of satisfaction. That movement is now a speech act. It means come. So when I impose meaning on the movement of my arm, I intentionally impose conditions of satisfaction on that movement. But since the movement was itself the condition of satisfaction to make the movement, of the intention to make the movement, so, so the intentional speech act is the imposition of conditions of satisfaction, namely the condition that somebody should come on the movement, uh, that is to say the imposition of conditions of satisfaction on conditions of satisfaction. Now that is so simple and so uh, easy that it's hard to see why did we go through all this struggle where we confuse meaning and communication. And I think the answer was it was a kind of re residual behaviorism. Uh, people thought, well, no, we really got to analyze this in terms of people's actual behavior, getting them to believe things, getting them to do things. But I want to say you need to distinguish between meaning, which equals communication of condition of satisfaction, uh, uh, condition of satisfaction on condition of satisfaction, and communication, which is 
the communication of meaning, and that is getting people to recognize the conditions of satisfaction. Again, let me give you some, it's a kind of an easy, simple, common sense idea. Let me give you some more examples to illustrate it. I gave you this example. I'm practicing French. So I go around saying things like, la plume de ma tante est dans le jardin de mon oncle. I don't know if people say that anymore, but that was the kind of nonsense that used to occur in, in uh, French texts. Or to take something much simpler, I'm standing in the shower and I say over, il pleut, il pleut, il pleut. Uh, and people say, but it's not raining, you idiot. You're just standing in the shower. And I say, no, no, I didn't mean il pleut. I was just saying il pleut. Okay, but now my intention had condition of satisfaction. I have to produce a French sentence exactly as she sounds. Il pleut, I say. Okay, but now if we go outdoors and I tell Pierre and Henriette, il pleut, I tell them it's raining, then I now mean what I say. I don't just say it, I say it and mean it. So what's the difference between me standing in the shower and intentionally saying over, il pleut, il pleut, and me going outdoors and actually telling somebody, il pleut. The part of the difference, not the whole difference, but part of the difference is that in the case when I say il pleut, when I'm actually meaning it, that utterance now has conditions of satisfaction, and those are conditions of satisfaction in addition to the fact that there was a condition of satisfaction to make the utterance. So making the utterance, il pleut, was the condition of satisfaction of my intention to make it. But that utterance now has truth conditions. It now has further conditions of satisfaction. But then if that's right, then it's easy to see what happens when I communicate. I get the hearer to recognize that I made the utterance and that the utterance had these conditions of satisfaction and I get him to recognize those by getting him to recognize that it was my intention that he should recognize them. He is intended to recognize them. So the effect of meaning is understanding, but understanding consists of the recognition of meaning, and communication is simply the communication of meaning, and in one sentence, the real, the deep mistake in Grice is that he confused meaning and communication. He tried to analyze meaning in terms of communication, whereas we need to distinguish the two. Why do we need to distinguish the two? Because what gets communicated is the meaning. There has to be some meaning that gets communicated, and that meaning is just the conditions of satisfaction. It's just the, and the creation of meaning is the creation of uh, the entity that has these further conditions of satisfaction. Okay, so I want that to sink in now, and let's take questions about that, and then I'll tell you some objections that people have made to that. See, what we're trying to get at is this. Uh, language is peculiar in that it is a form of intentional behavior, but it differs from other forms of intentional behavior. There's a difference between uh, I, I scratching your head and combing your hair and actually saying something. Well, what's the difference? Well, a crucial part of the difference is that when you're saying something and meaning something, when you're performing the speech act, then the speech act has conditions of satisfaction in addition to the condition of satisfaction of a normal action. So if my intention, I won't demonstrate it, but if I comb my hair, then the conditions of satisfaction are just that my hair is less messy or that it, I get the comb to go through it or whatever. But I, the remarkable thing about meaning is that the act that you intentionally perform now has some further meaning. It's now got some conditions of satisfaction. And to say that is to say that you have created an entity with conditions of satisfaction. That's your utterance. And now what makes it meaningful, what makes it the case that you mean that it's raining instead of you just saying il pleut, just pronouncing the words, is that you, your utterance now has truth conditions. So Grice's analysis works for communication. You, uh, you understand the communication by recognizing the, the speaker's intention uh, to create that meaning and to communicate it to you. 
But all the same, you need to distinguish within the total speech act between the meaningful part, the part that, that, is, that has the condition of satisfaction, and the communication part, because that's what you communicate. Now go back and think about those counterexamples. When I said something and meant what I said, even though I had no intention to communicate it, I was creating one of these. And then when I communicate it, what I do is I get uh, the hearer to recognize, A, that I have created this meaningful intention, uh, this meaningful entity, the speech act, and B, uh, that I uh, want him uh, to understand that I have created it. Uh, so the intention to communicate is the intention to produce understanding by getting the hearer to recognize the intention to produce that understanding, and what gets understood is meaning. Okay, I promised you I'd say it over and over, but I can keep going. But let's stop for questions about that, because now this is, a, uh, this is both a continuation of Grice's account, but it's a major shift because it distinguishes meaning from communication. Yes? Yeah. Well, uh, the question is, how do we know that we've actually created a meaningful uh, package in the first place? Uh, and the answer is that we can explain what the condition of satisfaction are. Now, sometimes you don't create a meaningful uh, package. People think they do. Uh, uh, they are called continental philosophers. Uh, and sometimes uh, they create packages. Uh, if I say uh, uh, the, uh, the absolute uh, is universal, and eternal, uh, that may be a meaningful, uh, they may think that's a meaningful package, but I'm not convinced that it is. I, I, I don't know Hegel well enough to pronounce his name right, but my impression is that he's said a lot of things like that. So I think there are, there are nons nonsensical claims made in philosophy. Uh, you don't hear much talk about the absolute, and it's one of the amazing facts that idealism was so powerful for so long. I mean, it was predictable prestigiously influential for literally, well, well over a hundred years. It died rather rapidly under the attacks by Moore and Russell, but it was very powerful for a long time. Uh, even though undergraduates never uh, really uh, they, I, uh, uh, accepted it much, there was a song, The Absolute, The Absolute Lives in a House of Ill Repute. I won't sing the whole damn song for you, uh, but I, uh, the, uh, the idea was this. Uh, if the world is entirely mental, then how do we succeed in communicating with other people? I have my mental states, you have your mental states. And the idea was that my mind is part of one great big mind, the absolute. And that's how we communicate because uh, the, uh, 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 we're, each of us is a fragment of the, we're a tiny fragment of the absolute. Now, you, you want examples of nonsense? I think this is probably all nonsense, but in any case, this was uh, something like this was widely adhered to, even in this university, because one of the, uh, the greatest American idealists ever was Josiah Royce. I don't know if he ever gave a lecture in this very uh, room, but in any case, he certainly taught on this campus. He was the uh, most influential American idealist totally without influence today, uh, as is the uh, most influential British idealist was Bradley, again, without influence, and both of those were followers of Hegel, and I don't know enough about Hegel to have an intelligent opinion. I've actually read some of Bradley and Royce, not much, but I, I, I didn't get very far with Hegel. Anyway, so I'm off the, I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you had in mind, but it is possible to talk nonsense, and sometimes people talk nonsense when they think they're making perfectly good sense. Say some more. Yes, right. Well, okay, here is the, the problem. I, if you want to explain your meaning, normally what you do is you give a paraphrase. Uh, now, the lazy thing to do is uh, what's called disquotation. Uh, uh, snow is white means snow is white. You just drop the quotation marks. 
I, and in some cases people do that, but that's when they say, well, I just meant what I said. I just meant exactly what I said. But normally, for practical purposes, when we're actually dealing with social situations, you explain what you mean. I spend much of my life explaining uh, uh, points about the philosophy of language or the philosophy of mind that people uh, otherwise don't understand. Uh, okay, so now what are the objections to my account that says, well, really what you're doing is imposing conditions of satisfaction on conditions of satisfaction, and that's not such a big deal. That, I think, is kind of the common sense uh, conception. So, for example, think of the guy uh, diagramming a football play. And he says, well, these will be the defensive players. Here's the front four, and here are the linebackers. Okay and here's our center, and here's our quarterback, and here are our two running backs, here's the tailback. Now, it's just a bunch of marks on the blackboard. What fact about the marks makes this one stand for the quarter, uh, this one stands for the uh, center, uh, and this one, uh, three, yes, yeah, and this one stand for the quarterback, and the answer is that's what we've decided. We've just arbitrarily said we're going to let this one be the quarterback, this is the center, these are the guards, the tackles, and the, uh, the, we got two split, we got two tight ends here, here's our uh, uh, split end, and here are the running backs. Now what fact about them makes that, that? Just we've decided. We have intentionally imposed meaning on these uh, marks, and we do that by deciding to treat the whole thing as having conditions of satisfaction. On this play, the quarterback will uh, uh, turn to the left and pass the, and, and uh, hand the ball off to the running back. I mean, this is a typical way that you innocently create meaning just by imposing meaning on entities that are not intrinsically meaningful. What's the objection of my account? Well, an objection that's made by my colleague, John McFarlane, and I need to talk to him more about this, so I don't, I'm not sure that I'm reporting him correctly. He says, but look, this is not an ordinary intention because ordinary intentions can fail. But how could you fail if you're imposing conditions of satisfaction on conditions of satisfaction? But I think there are a class of what I will call expressive intentions that really can't fail in the, in the way that it, you can fail to drive the nail in the board when you hit it with a hammer, or you can fail uh, to get to San Francisco if you're trying to drive to San Francisco. And those are where you're just expressing your intentional states. If Robinson Crusoe decides uh, that whenever uh, he sees bad weather, he's going to express disgust by saying, yeah, I won't pronounce it, uh, then he just does. I mean, that's his, uh, he has that uh, intention, and there's no way that he can fail. He might mispronounce the word or something like that. But, but speech act intentions are like that, in that whatever else you succeed in doing, you can succeed in meaning something. You can't always succeed in communicating something, and sometimes the meaning will be uh, muddled or even incoherent, but all the same, the ways that actions fail because you do not achieve the effects that you want to achieve. You wanted to drive the nail into the board uh, and you fail to do that. Or you wanted to get to San Francisco in the car, you fail to do that. Speech act intentions don't fail like that. So the, uh, the objection to my account that, well, it's too easy uh, to create meaning just by intentionally imposing condition of satisfaction, I want to say it is easy. Uh, we did it uh, the football coach does it all the time when he, descri when he uh, describes, when he uh, diagrams a play on the blackboard. He creates entities that are not, in, he takes entities that are not intrinsically meaningful, X's and O's, and he makes a meaningful representation out of them. Yes? Um, is there also a requirement that it be possible for others to recognize what conditions you've imposed, like in your German example? Yeah. Or Yes, uh, I, I think you can uh, create meaningful um, entities that are not communicable in that particular context. Now, I don't think that has the consequence, however, that you can say anything and mean anything. Uh, why? Well, because the conventional meanings that I know constrain the possibilities. I mean, this is the Humpty Dumpty case in Alice in Wonderland. 
uh, can you just say anything and mean anything? And I remember, it's not Alice, but somebody who says, well, it's just a question of who's going to be the boss here. If I want to decide these words mean what I want them to mean. Uh, but I can't go to my philosophy department meeting, meeting and say, um, uh, 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 birds typically sing with their fingers. Uh, and what I mean is, we should allocate more budget money next year to uh, paying the TAs more. Uh, I, now, if I have a very recondite philosophy department, and I have structured the context uh, appropriately, so they remember their Jean Cocteau movies, uh, and I say, l'oiseau chante avec ses doigts, and they have this absurd, uh, absurdly complicated background whereby they can understand all that. Okay, maybe I can do it. But in an unstructured situation, you can't just say anything and mean anything because you're constrained by uh, the possibilities of what you already know. However, you know, work some more on it. I mean, see what you, uh, see what you turn up with that. Okay, how are we doing for time? Uh, do I have any time left? Two minutes? Wow, what can I say in two minutes? Well, okay, here's what I want you to remember. Grice made an enormous advance, and what he did was domesticate meaning by, by showing how it could become part of ordinary human behavior. So what we've got to do in analyzing the Speech Act is capture two things. It is an action. The Speech Act is the performance of an action, just as much as combing your hair or scratching your head or walking across the room. But it's a special kind of action because it is meaningful in a special way. It has conditions of satisfaction, and I'll explain those to you in more detail next Tuesday.